So I have my laptop in front of me because I've got my notes and I want to make sure I do my best to stay on target with messaging and substance. So there isn't room at the podium, so forgive me for, for sitting here. I very much feel like a sports anchor. You know, three minutes around the NFL with a recap is what I feel like I'm going to be doing with you. But just to give you a little bit of a context for my comments, during 36 years of practicing law in this space, including my tenure with the SEC's Enforcement Division, I see a lot of companies and their leaders who want to get it right but are not well advised or counseled, and, view as and I view it as important to help educate about the risk side of the equation. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. And again, for a little bit more context, I spent almost 10 years in the SEC's Enforcement Division, was a federal prosecutor, public corruption and securities, and I do work actively in the defense of federal and regulatory investigations, internal corporate investigations, and corporate monitorships. So my three takeaways for you to sort of project what I want to touch on is one is to understand the long arm of the SEC and other regulators and the challenging enforcement environment that exists at the moment. As Doug Elinoff mentioned this morning, there are 50% fewer publicly traded companies than when he, and I a few years earlier than Doug, began practicing law in this space. But there also are more interested enforcers. There are more, there are more actors to scrutinize fewer participants. And those enforcers have larger staffs. And as part of that, the alphabet soup has expanded. And I'm going to touch on, on all of that. Also, you just heard a moment about you know the the administration. You know, with a change of administration in November, with the potential for a change of administration in November, thus we're talking about in January 2025, the SEC is moving cases more quickly than ever before while under investigating them. The SEC is in for the SEC enforcements and the SEC chair Gensler's message is, and, and these are actual words that I quote, act with a sense of urgency. There's actually a case out of Utah, and I'm not going to talk to you about law cases. I don't have to worry about it, but it's really interesting and sort of hot off the press. And that is in August of last year, meaning in 2023, the SEC was granted a temporary restraining order after presenting evidence. In November, a federal judge in Utah ordered the SEC attorneys to explain why they should not be sanctioned by the court after presenting what the judge regarded as false and misleading evidence in their attempt to bring the temporary restraining order uh, against the company and against other defendants. After the threat of court sanctions, the SEC decided to drop the charges. In a brief that actually was filed yesterday, and when I say yesterday, I mean yesterday, the SEC that it made a mistake and will work to ensure these errors do not happen again, the SEC asked the judge to accept a motion to dismiss the action without prejudice, which they will be filing, as the only penalty against the SEC. The final chapter of this book has not yet come out, obviously, has not been written, but in that context, it comes back to what I said a moment ago, which is they really are under-investigating the ca cases right now and are pulling the, triggers very, pulling the trigger very quickly. The second takeaway for you is merely raising capital privately, such as the venture capital route, does not in and of itself offer a pass in the eyes of regulators. If someone's engaged in the offer and sale of securities, the SEC long arm is present. So you have to make certain that if you're operating under an exemption, you understand that exemption, how it works, and what could cause that exemption to be lost. The third takeaway is know who is at risk of this aggressive mindset. And the answer to that is issuers, officers and directors, IR firms, capital raisers, registered and unregistered, as well as gatekeepers. I know there are a number of you folks who are here, particularly to hear what, I want to say, what I'm going to be saying about gatekeepers. And when I say gatekeepers, I'm talking about at risk, including the lawyers, accountants, auditors, underwriters, transfer agents, and credit rating agencies. Now, if time would otherwise permit, I could actually name for you SEC enforcement cases against each of these sets of gatekeepers. This is not just grabbing a list of gatekeepers, throwing them in. In the last year, there have been cases against, each of the, in, against gatekeepers in each of these areas, including actions against four underwriters for filing to meet disclosure requirements when offering municipal bonds, which was a first of its kind action in recent months for the SEC. As I said, these are not a list of who is a gatekeeper, 
but without naming names, I have, I have or have had clients in investigations in every one of these categories. So moving now to what I would call SEC enforcement, the microcap market targets. The SEC in the past few months charged 10 microcap companies for noncompliance with Reg A. What the SEC wrote in its enforcement orders was that these companies had qualified initially for Reg A, but subsequently made one or more significant changes to their offerings, such that the offerings no longer met the requirements of the exemption, such as increasing the number of shares offered, increasing or decreasing the price of shares offered, or engaging in prohibited delayed offerings. But more broadly than just Reg A, SEC enforcement continues to prioritize unregistered offerings, arguing that noncompliance with registration provisions of the federal securities laws deprives investors of required disclosures necessary to make informed investment decisions. There is also an intense focus on investment advisor compliance with the marketing rule. The SEC charged nine investment advisors in orders, and, and I'm talking about in the past fiscal year, charging that each of the nine firms advertise hypothetical performance to mass audiences on their websites without having in place required policies and procedures. Particularly at risk in this space, stock manipulation. And stock manipulation remains a high priority, and we see more and more criminal indictments for microcap manipulations, particularly out of the United States Attorney's offices in the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District of New York, Northern District of Illinois, which is basically Chicago, District of Massachusetts, which is Boston, Central District of California, which is basically Los Angeles, Northern District of California, San Francisco, and the Southern District of Florida, Miami. In fact, recently the SEC charged eight social media influencers for using social media to manipulate exchange-traded stocks in a $100 million securities fraud scheme. In the areas of investment professionals and service providers, the SEC in its last fiscal year, as just two examples, because there are many more, brought charges against a private equity firm for non-disclosure of brokerage fees paid to another firm that was owned by the private equity firm's CEO. And the other example is an investment advisor related, a case against an investment advisor related to undisclosed conflicts of interest. And actually, at this time, as I'm sitting here speaking with you, I'm actually defending two similar investigations. The other thing that I point out in this context is there is close cooperation between the SEC, FINRA's market surveillance, and OTC markets. They are communicating with each other, which then brings me to sort of the next topic within my comments to you, which is what I call the investigations feeding, feeding frenzy. Who's actually talking to the SEC, the PCAOB, and the Department of Justice? And it's not just who is talking to the SEC, but understanding that the SEC, PCAOB, FINRA, and DOJ are all talking to each other. That's very different than it was a number of years ago. And with, with the focus on federal and self-regulatory, the, the, on the federal enforcement and self-regulatory organization level, don't lose sight over the fact that states also are extremely active and three in particular that are very active in the enforcement arena are New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Within the investigation's free feeding frenzy and who's talking to the SEC in particular, you hear a lot about the SEC's whistleblower program. The SEC publicizes widely its awards, including more than $600 million awarded last year. The SEC received more than 18,000 tips in 2023, yeah, 18,000 tips. And as a result, for example, if you want to be a whistleblower, there actually now is an art to getting a whistleblower tip investigated at the commission. And, you know, and in fact, given how successful the SEC's program has been, the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York recently announced that it is experimenting with a whistleblower program. Additionally, the last point I want to make in terms of who's talking to the regulators in the United States International cooperation in enforcement is at an unprecedented level. The reason is countries have invested in developing relationships for cross-border enforcement. I speak from experience with this, not only having been involved back, even back when I was at the SEC and knew how 
difficult it was to go operation, but more recently in my role as having been U.S. counsel to the corporate monitor, who was called the independent auditor, in Volks Volkswagen's settlement with the, with the Environmental Protection Agency in, D in Dieselgate. And another good example of international cooperation, if you look at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act cases, particularly with a country such as, such as Brazil. Which then brings me now to the next topic I wanted to touch on, which is gatekeeper liability. Specifically, auditors, lawyers, and compliance officers in the crosshairs. In 1990, then federal judge Stanley Sporkin, who was the second director of the, enforce, of the SEC's enforcement division in the agency's history, in an opinion in the Lincoln Savings and Loan case, wrote the following. I'm going to read you the direct quote. Where were these professionals when these clearly improper actions were being consummated? Why didn't any of them speak up or disassociate themselves from the transaction? What is difficult to understand is that with all the professional talent involved, both accounting and legal, why at least one professional would not have blown the whistle to stop the overreaching that took place in this case. And those are the words, written words of then Judge Stanley Sporkin. That is the mindset that regulators are bringing to the concept of gatekeeper liability. If the gatekeepers, if the gatekeepers do their jobs and something is legitimately concealed or there's a circumstance change, there will not be liability. I want to stress there will not be liability. I'm not saying that there would not be an investigation, there may not be an investigation, but what I'm saying is that ultimately there would not be liability, and the SEC acknowledges that. But the SEC's position is that gatekeepers share responsibility for protecting investors and consider gatekeepers to play critical roles in the capital markets as the first line of defense against misconduct. The other thing is, it's important to understand what I call, what I would refer to as the limitations to companies, officers and directors, of the limitations around what we refer to as a reliance defense. There's a mistaken belief that I have competent professionals around me, so that is sufficient. First, there is no legal defense with the SEC to mitigate the intent of reliance on the auditors. But second, a great misimpression is reliance on counsel, meaning reliance on the advice of counsel, is not the mere presence of counsel. That is a major mistake that a lot of companies make, thinking I have a, I have a lawyer with me, I've talked to the lawyer, and therefore, you know, I'm protected. Reliance on counsel is not presence of counsel. Reliance on counsel requires full disclosure and specific advice on a particular issue. For the auditors in the audience, which I think there may be some, <clears throat> PCAOB inspections and enforcement are tearing, in, are, are tearing into audits of everything crypto. One of the highest profile SEC cases in 2023 involving auditors charged systemic quality control failures in auditing standards in connection with audit work for SPACs. For the SEC and the PCOB, auditor independence and client acceptance procedures are a high priority. I currently have an auditing firm client that often consults with me regarding client acceptance issues, recognizing that risk, just to make sure that they have dotted their I's and crossed their T's. The PCOB takes a particularly hard line with small firms, simply because the PCAOB knows that it can. It will bring actions against principal partners, but not the firms, as a backdoor route to shutting down the firms. The PCAOB knows full well that the litigation cost is prohibitive, and is, I should say is cost prohibitive. And the PCAOB is seeking and getting disproportionately unreasonable civil monetary penalties because it knows the cost of litigation far outweighs the cost of paying the financial penalty. Thankfully, there is a constitutional challenge to the PCOB's enforcement authority that's currently pending in federal court, and actually, I too may be filing one in the next couple of weeks. In the next next couple of weeks, um, what, the next topic before I conclude that I want to touch on are what I call common mistakes causing enforcement liability beyond the obvious of making materially false and misleading statements, omitting to disclose material facts, updating information timely, and maintaining accurate books and records and controls. I'm going to highlight three such mistakes, and 
Be happy to discuss these with anyone if you'd like afterwards. One is paying un unregistered finders. A second common mistake is not monitoring what is being said about the company. And a third is not appreciating the importance of the response to the first regulatory communication. That response is critical substantively and for setting the tone in interacting with regulars, regulators. I actually, I'll never forget a call that I placed when I was at SEC enforcement to the owner of a transfer agent. I told the owner we were planning to bring a 10B, an anti-fraud violation action, as well as transfer agent books and records charges. The owner was genuinely shocked. That transfer agent presumed that communicating without the aid of, without the aid of counsel would not be an issue because the owner had not assessed that owner's and firm's own liability and exposure. And in fact, I have several investigations right now that I'm defending, including one in that's actually in litigation with the SEC, where corporate counsel handling the in initial communications with SEC enforcement clearly missed the mark and boxed the client into an, an inevitable SEC enforcement action. The, I want to touch on, before I forget, the dark, what I call the dark hole of OTC markets, skull and crossbones, and SEC trading suspensions. And there is no due process leading up to imposition of either. Recovery from each is extremely difficult. Switching to SEC trading suspensions, the SEC went absolutely wild during COVID. There's a very tight timetable for challenging a trading suspension, and the threshold for the SEC to impose them is incredibly low. I actually challenged one in May of 2020, this is all public, that I took the United States Court of Appeals in DC that is now back at the SEC and is still unresolved as a trading suspension four years later. These are reputation and business killers. So I wanna hit eight points for you in terms of mitigating against enforcement risk. One is don't shortchange compliance. Second is ensure transparency with your auditors and lawyers. That is full disclosure. Third, for the gatekeepers, particularly the auditors and lawyers, make certain that experienced eyes touch everything before it goes out, particularly opinions. Don't be afraid to ask. Fourth, don't trade cost for quality in selecting your professional service providers. Quality matters and regulators understand who is knowledgeable and who is not. Number five, DNO insurance, cyber insurance, and ENO insurance. I'm not an insurance salesman, but defense costs can be brutal. And understand your policies and obligations. Number six, make certain you understand your obligations. Don't just rely on the professionals to get done everything for you. Number seven, read everything, including check boxes, because a signature on a document includes the logical presumption that everything has been read. And last, number eight, if you need to enter the enforcement defense space, make certain that your attorneys have the requisite inside the agency experience to be able to effectively advise on all of the nuances that go into defending investigations. Now, actually, I, hit, I wrote myself a note to hit this at 359, and I'm there. So I really am wrapping up. So here are my concluding thoughts for you. Number one, when the regulators come knocking, that fully supportive circle around you will collapse and the last person standing beside you will be your defense lawyer. I have seen and continue to see these circles of advisors collapse quickly once the subpoenas start flying. So take steps proactively to minimize the need to call the enforcement, the enforcement professionals. I had the privilege of doing an interview last week with Adam Torres for his Mission Matters podcast. We jumped right in and he did not get a chance to ask his icebreaker question of what is your mission. Mine in this space is caring about the client and understanding the personal pressure and trepidation that investigations bring. You here today are the heart and soul of capital formation and entrepreneurship. Please protect your platforms, your missions, and your visions with close and careful attention to compliance and risk mitigation. Thank you. And I'll stay around for any other questions afterwards too. How, uh, uh, how, how much are, is, the, is the SEC going after marketing companies? I'm a marketing company, and obviously anytime we do anything, we show it to an attorney, 
Um, we, do, uh, we, you know, we do very, very careful things. And I'm wondering, are, are they on the backs of a lot of marketing companies like, like that? You know, the, the, cha the challenge in the investigative space is really being able to know what is what we're not seeing. So when I'm referring to any statistics, I'm really referring generally to what has the what has the SEC actually brought out in its cases in the last fiscal year, or sometimes I'll refer to multiple fiscal years. I mean, I have um, one or two investor relation firms that, that actually are, actually are our clients. Um, and often it's because at one point they had an issue or some governance concern that they wanted to address proactively because of an SEC inquiry. That's often how I tend to get involved. I am finding, you know, the real point of risk for the marketing companies is maybe the le is less the SEC, what I call ab initio at the start, but it's FINRA market surveillance. And the reason for that is FINRA market surveillance sends out inquiries to the marketing companies to the extent that their names appear in connection with information. So if you, if you remember, one of the things I referred to is that initial response to the regulator is critical. So how you respond to FINRA market surveillance, which in turn is going to talk to the SEC, and which in turn may lead to an investigation, that trading suspension case that I referred to, um, that I took to the United States Court of Appeals, actually started as a report from FINRA market surveillance. So a lot of it is, how do you handle those communications to manage it? But it sounds like you're doing the right thing to make sure that you have counsel who is reviewing, and many IR firms or marketing firms will also ensure that there is company sign-off on anything. But at the same time, we have not really seen cases where the commission is saying, well, even with all that sign-off, you didn't do adequate due diligence, but I do think that there is risk to simply take information and republish it. I'm working with a pink sheet company right now that has filed for a Reg A last spring, an amendment to their Reg A last spring, and they keep coming back with comments that seem to me like they don't really want to do want them to do the offering. They come back like your your latest filing with the financials within the wrong category or they're a wrong column even. And it's like, what? I mean, come on. My you question know. to you would be who's coming back with the, who's coming back with those comments? The SEC's comments. The again, you are talking I, I mean I I'm not suggesting there will or will not be, because I don't have the crystal ball. A have you seen them not like uh, follow-on offerings, reg A's by, uh, by pink sheet companies? I, I, I refer to the fact that the SEC has recently brought some cases involving reg A offerings, and particularly the, you know, the follow-on, uh, you know, what I call the follow-on to the, to the reg A offerings. So again, that is an area that is certainly under scrutiny, and the SEC has made no bones about the fact that it has you know, a, a specific interest in, in the reg A offerings. Awesome. Thank you very much. Seems like uh, you gents should talk some more. And if there are any other questions, uh, grab Jacob afterwards. Thank you.